I know I should have probably done this video at the beginning, but I wanted to show a couple of recipes first um, from my dad's old campfire cooking tape. Here is the intro. Hope you like it. You know, food just seems to taste better out here. I don't know what it is. My name is Robert Borgers, and uh, I'm the one that baked these biscuits. I've been baking biscuits and cooking pot roast and apple cobbler and cooking breakfast on a fire like this for over 30 years. And uh, I'm gonna teach you all the know-how and the techniques of cooking on a fire like this. And before it's all over, you're gonna be a great campfire cook. Now, when I'm talking about campfire cook, I'm not talking about gourmet cooking. We're talking about uh, strictly basic home cooking and meat and potato type cooking. We're also not talking about uh, backyard cooking. Uh, this is not uh, charcoal briquettes or anything like that. We're, we're working on the ground pit here and using uh, nature's own materials. Uh, the biggest obstacle out here that uh, people face is the fact that they're used to cooking on their own home stove where they can thermostatically dial the temperature and the time. What you don't know is once you've learned the technique of cooking out here, we can do exactly the same thing. I'm gonna teach you how to build a fire, the proper cooking fire. I'm gonna teach you how to set the coals. I'm gonna teach you how to gauge the temperature and how to regulate and maintain the heat throughout the cooking time. And if you think about it, really that's the only main difference between your kitchen stove and this primitive cooking fire. And once you've mastered that, you should be able to try any recipe that your heart desires, uh, along with a few techniques and a little practice why you should have the confidence to, to cook your favorite recipe. And I'll guarantee you one thing, it'll taste better. Uh, for some reason, as I said before, food tastes better out here. And uh, another thing, people don't expect to have a full course meal out here. They're used to roasting weenies, so uh, they'll be marveled at that. Let's, uh, let me go over the format that we're gonna cover, and then we'll get started. First thing we're gonna cover is the fire. That's the most important part. We're gonna cover the location of the fire. We're gonna cover the shape of the fireplace. Uh, we're gonna go into woods. You have to use a proper kind of woods. Then we're actually gonna build a fire. You'd be, you'd be surprised how many people 
don't know how to build a proper fire. I'm going to cover a little safety. And I'm going to teach you how to gauge the temperature. I'm going to teach you how to regulate and maintain that temperature, which is extremely important. Then we're going to lay out uh, some basic equipment that you need out here to uh, make cooking a little more pleasurable. Uh, after that, we're actually going to get into some cooking and some recipes. Uh, I've got some good recipes. They're tried and proven. And uh, uh, we're going to go through those. But mainly what I want to show is the, uh, the technique of cooking, like braising and, and frying and uh, stewing and baking. I believe that'll about get it. Let's, uh, if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get started. As I said before, the fire is the most important part. First thing is the location. You want to be sure and get out of the wind. Uh, the wind can cause the fire to burn too fast, and it also it's a fire hazard. So find an obstruction, but get out of the wind. Also, you want to be sure and get out uh, away from any combustible material. And if you do have some, why, well, clean it out. We don't want any fire hazards out here. The shape of the fireplace is important also. What I generally use is a keyhole shape, and it's a round area with an open area here. The principle behind that is in the round, large areas where you build your supply fire. And when it burns down, then you rake your coals over into the open keyhole shape here and that's where you do most of your cooking. You also want to be sure and face your open area where you're going to cook into the prevailing wind. The wind will be blowing this way, and you will probably be sitting right here. And that way, the heat and the smoke will not be blowing in your face. And that's real important. Now, your firewood is probably one of the most important things about building a proper campfire. Here we have a good example of what I'm talking about. What we need is hardwoods, uh, standing dead wood trees. Uh, the reason I say standing is because they're vertical and they stay dry. Even in the worst rain, well, they'll, they'll stay dry and they'll burn. This is what we have in Texas. This is mesquite. This is real good hardwood. Here's an example of hickory. And uh, we have a lot of that around here, too. And this is oak. Mostly what we burn with is oak. And this is good hardwood. Also good woods are uh, apple, cherry, poplar, ash, birch, rock elm, locust. These are all good hardwoods. And they burn for a long time, because a lot of times you have a meal that has to last, you know, a good fire for about an hour. Now be sure and avoid your soft woods, uh, particularly your evergreens willow, box elder, uh, white elm, basswood. These are all soft, they're short burning, and uh, they're smoky, they're poppy, and they have an unpleasant odor. So, uh, you know, if you want a pleasant, long-lasting fire, use, use good hardwoods. Next, we're going to build a fire. This uh, may sound a little elementary, but you'd be surprised how many people don't know how to build a fire. I have these little piles here for the purpose of demonstration. Normally I wouldn't do this, but we have small, little kindling, and then we have little larger twigs, and then we have your good sized logs here. Initially, you want to start with, uh, you can start a fire with, here's one example. You can use uh, your fire starter, liquid fire starter, which is generally a form of kerosene. I don't recommend this. It's a little bit dangerous. Uh, your canned heat is good. It's safe. You can dig out about a spoonful and put it in there, and it'll start up pretty good. Uh, what I like to do is either use pine needles, shavings, or just good old paper, and that's what we're going to do. Let me say this before we get started here. Be sure, for safety purposes and for the sake of a forest, be sure and have water handy and a shovel, just in case some sparks catch around here. Now, we've got the paper, and what you want to do, the principle of building a fire is to start small and work large, and that's all there is to it. It's just simple as that. But be careful 
be careful never to smother a fire because a fire has to have oxygen. And if you don't believe that, hike up to about 13,000 feet and try to start a fire. It's hard. You have to do a lot of blowing. Now, when you, before you start a fire, always check your wind. Okay, now we're kind of blowing this way. Always start your fire upwind. And that way, your fire, your wind will blow your fire into your wood. Okay, what we need to do is just let that, let that burn down a little bit, and it's going to take, oh, about two minutes, and when it burns down, then we slowly add larger sticks, and we get larger and larger, and that way we don't smother the fire. Well, it's been about four minutes now, and it's burned down just about right now where we can put some larger, heavier hardwood on top. And so we can build up some real, real nice hardwood coals that'll last a long time. Well, the main fire has burned down into a good, nice bed of coals, and that's what we want. We want to cook on coals. Coals are predictable. They're even burning. Flames, too erratic. So always cook on coals. Now what we're doing here is we're dragging coals over here from the main supply fire over into a cooking area, which is the open part of the keyhole. Boy, that's hot. I'm going to try to build about a medium fire here. And I'm going to show you in just a second how to gauge that. All right. Now, we've got it into the open area here. Put our grill on. And we want to take our glove off. And this is called the palm test. This is gauging the fire. And this is extremely important because you want to be able to gauge the fire to know what temperature it is. The way you do it, it's a palm test. I'll place my palm roughly in the area of where my cooking pot's going to be. And low is five seconds. If you can hold your palm over there, five seconds. 101, 102, 103, 104, 105. That's roughly 200 to 300 degrees. You, that's what you cook uh, beans and stew, slow cooking. Uh, medium is about three to four seconds. And that is roughly uh, 300, 350, 400 degrees, something like that. That's where you cook your roast, your chicken rice, uh, you bake uh, biscuits, things like that. High is a quick two seconds, 101, 102. And you've got to pull it off. And that's 500 degrees on up. And that's where you want to charcoal your steaks or uh, french fries or you can even boil water at that temperature. So I'm going to see. I tried to build about a medium heat here, and let's just see what I've got here. One and one, one and two. Whoa, that's a little high. So what we want to do is just take take a few out, and that's how you control it. Periodically, you want to check your heat. All right. Throughout your recipe, check your heat and make sure you have the desired temperature. 101, 102, 103, 104. Okay, that's about right. Uh, like I say, you want to check your heat and control it. This is where you regulate and control it. Control it. Just pushing your coals in or out, whatever your recipe dictates. And this is what makes it as close as possible to your uh, home kitchen, kitchen stove. Uh, this will build confidence because you can. You know, if you can regulate your heat, well, you can really cook anything without burning it. Now, this is roughly the equipment we're going to need to make campfire cooking easy, or easier. First thing, of course, an axe, 
chop wood. This nice garbage bag, plastic bag, they're invaluable. A good shovel to dig your fire pits and also keep it around for safety purposes. A pair of leather gloves for handling pots and messing with the fire, gotta have those. These long handle tongs, you need two of them. You need one to move coals in and out, regulate your heat, and one for food like steaks and chicken that you're charbroiling. Your uh, insect fogger, that's nice in the summertime. Heavy duty Reynolds wrap, you need heavy duty foil out here. Ziploc bags for storage, uh, they're just invaluable out here. It keeps everything either dry or wet, whatever you may wish. And uh, a couple of two or three nice sharp butcher knives. A uh, potato masher, your long handle spoons, forks, long handle spatulas, and of course your uh, can opener. A grill, I made this back in high school a long time ago. I generally have two grills, uh, one on a hot fire, one on a cool fire. Your oven thermometer, uh, this is help gauge your heat and it'll save your palm. We'll get into that. Two cooking pots here for vegetables with lids. Your uh, Teflon skillet. Now, the only reason the pioneers, early pioneers, didn't use Teflon skillets because they didn't have them. They are nice. Your cheese grater. This is good for cheese or hash brown potatoes. Over here. A nice thick cast iron skillet. That's a deep frying skillet for stewing or braising. A wide bottom coffee pot. Your spray oil. This is really handy. You're always trying to lubricate something out here. And then your Dutch oven. This is probably one of the most important items out here. If I was going to pick one, this is the one I'd have. This you can do anything. Stew and braise and boil, whatever. Over here, this, I just want to point this out. This is a fish, little fish net for storing fish. What we use it for is when you're in a high mountain area and you have a cold stream, you can put your, put your food in Ziploc bags and store them in the stream and it keeps the varmints away. That's a handy thing. Cutting board, got to have them. It also serves as a little table. All your utensils here, I bought all these for $5 at a flea market, anything will do. Your plates, saucers, uh, be sure and buy the thickest you can because I generally put them on the side of the grill to warm and uh, when you eat while you, it keeps your food warmer. The thicker they are, the warmer they stay. Bic lighter, these are great, they work forever. Paper, bag, uh, paper uh, towels, we always use those. We use them all day long. This is a flour mix. Uh, you can use a commercial mix if you want to. I mix my own. Uh, all you have to add is water or egg. Depends on whether you're gonna make biscuits or pancakes or muffins. Mixing bowls for salads and also for baking. Your spices. Uh, there's a various array of spices here. What I always do is I mix my own spice because it's more convenient. Uh, I've got a little onion salt, garlic salt, a little paprika, and lemon pepper in here, and I put it on practically everything. Cooler, a nice thick cooler here. Uh, I get them nice and thick and sturdy so I can sit on them, use them as a chair also. And then a collapse collapsible water jug, and these are nice because you can transport them, collapse them down to almost nothing. Uh, shovel, well, you know, to dig your pit and keep it around just in case there's a little fire start around here. Anyway, that's, uh, that's roughly what you need out here, more or less. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look around, you probably have 90% of this in your own home. And what you don't have, well, you can buy at a flea market. Uh, a lot of this you don't need, but uh, I'm displaying it all. Uh, it makes life a lot easier out here for me, I know that.